And so the previous speakers touched on a lot of the uh, bits and pieces that I want to talk about, so hopefully I'll bring a little bit more to the table at a slightly different perspective. So as you may have heard, maybe a little birdie told you, um, most of the poultry industry is in, in a state of transition. <clears throat> as a lot of them are going towards antibiotic free, uh, no antibiotics ever. And this is to meet the demands of the consumer and meet with regulations that are coming out due to those consumer demands. In an industry roundtable that was held back in 2014, it was a general consensus by all the experts, both nutritionists and veterinarians that were on the panel, that the biggest stumbling box as they are transitioning to antibiotic-free systems is preventing necrotic enteritis without the use of those in-feed medications. <laughs> So let's, I want to look a little bit uh, at the differences and why, why is necrotic such a big issue? Well, here's a conventional program. Here's your necrotic enteritis. Looking at the gut health program, we had a lot of tools in the toolbox. We have your AGPs, you have your antibiotics, you have your ionophores. There we go. Now if we look at the antibiotic-free program or an NAE program, those tools are gone. So what do we have to help support our gut health program? So when it comes to necrotic enteritis, a lot of people just think clostridium perfringens. It's caused by clostridium perfringens and overgrowth of clostridium perfringens. Yes, it is clostridium perfringens, but really it's the underlying predisposing factor that we need to look at. Necrotic enteritis is a very complicated, complicated um, disease. <clears throat> and there's a lot of factors at play when it comes to leading into a situation where we have a break with necrotic enteritis. So for example, there could be uh, management issues that are causing increased bacterial load in the house. For example, poor hatchery or egg sanitation, uh, reduced house downtime, little, poor little quality or high stocking densities. Another one that's pretty well known is that high concentrations of indigestible dietary protein um, can be used by clostridium in the hindgut. And we get a little bit more into that. So there's, there's different ways that you can have uh, poor protein digestibility in a bird. We have poor digestive enzyme activity. Say there's some type of factor that's reducing or um, impairing that epithelial lining and reducing those cells' ability to produce uh, enzymes. Or we could have poor quality uh, protein in the diet. This reduced uh, or poor digested uh, protein then will travel down to the post ileum, which increases the protein availability for that clostridium perfringens. So what happens is the clostridium perfringens ferments that additional protein. Since we're talking about protein, it's actually called putrefaction. And that putrefaction leads to the production of biogenic amines as well as short-chain fatty acids. Now these aren't the short-chain fatty acids that we normally hear about that are great for, for gut health. Since we're looking at putrefaction, the breakdown of proteins, your normal short-chain fatty acids would be your butyric acid, your, your propionic. This would be isobutyric, isopropionic, which can be used by pathogens uh, to enhance growth. And kind of here, just to prove my point, is a study done by Drew et al. Uh, looking at two different sources of protein. Uh, both were held at a similar um, overall crude protein. So we have our fish meal, which is generally known to be um, poorly digested. And then you have your soy protein source. And you can see that both in the ileum, which is here in the blue bar, and the cica here in the green bar, that the fish meal had a higher, those birds fed the, um, the fish meal had higher amounts of clostridium perfringens in the ileum and the, and the cica compared to the soy fed birds. Another well uh, known predisposing factor is imeria. So Todd showed this a little bit before. So coccidiosis, the protozoa, when it's going through its asexual stage of reproduction, it's continuously um, invading those epithelial cells. And as it's doing that, it's causing those, uh, those cells to damage and the epithelial lining to damage. <clears throat> and that's allowing a leakage of plasma proteins into the lumen. 
those plasma proteins are then a protein source that the clostridium perfringens can use um, to start proliferating. Lastly is mycotoxins. This is actually a topic that's more recently developed um, <coughs> in the literature. So these mycotoxins cause intestinal damage and immune suppression. So we're essentially setting up the bird uh, for trouble. So we saw this before, but uh, so this was a study by Antonisen in 2014 is when it was published, demonstrating that Don, the mycotoxin Don, when it comes in, reduces that transepithelial resistance in the epithelial layer, thus reducing that epithelial integrity. So we're reducing that barrier in between the epithelial cells. This is uh, reducing nutrient uptake, as well as allowing the plasma proteins to leak into the lumen and act as a nutrient source for the bacterial populations, including those clostridium perfringens. So here, um, just as Tab was showing before, they used a model where they had no clostridium control feed, no clostridium with their Don feed, and you can see that there was no um, uptick in the amount of birds that had necrotic enteritis. Then they had their clostridium perfringens model on a control feed, and we see an increase in the amount of the percentage of birds that had necrotic enteritis lesions. But when they added Don to the feed, we saw a significant increase uh, in the amount of birds demonstrating those ne necrotic enteritis lesions. So there's, there's a synergistic effect here. And if we looked at those birds, so we're, if we break it down, just look at these birds, those birds had, those fed Don had more severe lesions than those on the control diet. So this brings us to the question, how do we make both sides happy? We have the consumer side that's looking for good quality food with no antibiotics, then we have on the producer side, we want optimum performance and we want healthy livestock. So how do we bring those together? And really, it all focuses on gut health and what we can do to help manage that gut health and set that bird up for success and help prevent necrotic enteritis. And there's been a lot of research um, in this area and a lot of it is focusing on those natural feed additives, probiotics, phytogenics, different types of enzymes to help improve that gut health. So first, I think, uh, we should be starting by looking at the gut microbiota. <clears throat> and for those who are not in, actively in this type of research, looking at the microbial profile, I don't think there's an understanding of how significant it is. Yes, there's bacteria in the gut, but they play such a huge role in the overall development of that bird. They play a role in just the intestinal development, the physiology of that bird, immunology, nonspecific to resistance. So it plays a much bigger role overall than I think a lot of people understand. And these microorganisms directly interact with that lining of the gastrointestinal tract and affect the immune system of that bird. I'm glaring at you. <laughs> so the microbiota, it's, it's a community. A lot of people think it's just bacteria, but it's a community of bacteria, yeast, fungi, protozoa, viruses. It's a community that works together, hopefully um, for the better. <clears throat> so in a, in a balanced system or in a, in a state of eubiosis, there's a balance between those physiological microbiota and those pathogenic microbiota, which is keeping intestinal integrity intact and keeping the physiological inflammation um, going. Now there's a lot of situations that can alter this balance. There's antibiotics that can disrupt the balance. There's diet, there's hygiene, there's different stressors um, that can cause uh, upset in that balance. And this is called dysbiosis. <clears throat> this dysbi dysbiosis can lead to damaged epithelial barrier, increased bacterial adherence and penetration, and lead to pathological inflammation, which is very costly to overall production and performance of that bird. So one way to help promote eubiosis is through the use of a probiotic. And as we touched on before, a probiotic is a microorganism used for the benefit of the host and help balancing out um, that intestinal microbiota. So here we did a trial um, using a control here in the blue bar, the probiotic 
here in the gray bar, and then we used an AGP as a comparison, which is here in the green bar. In this case, it was avlomycin. And we can see that the probiotic group did significantly increase the amount of bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and those gram-positive cocci in those birds. So helping promote those more beneficial types of, of bacteria. <clears throat> Another way to help promote uh, the more beneficial um, microbial profile is the use of phytogenic feed additives. Um, <clears throat> this is a study that was done a few years ago looking at, we had a control, an AGP group. In this group, it was uh, B uh, BMD in this case, and then a phytogenic feed additive. And in this trial, we saw that the phytogenic feed additive was able to decrease the amount of total coliforms in the cica of those birds the amount of anaerobic bacteria that they saw, while in this case the AGP we didn't see a significant difference, as well as a reduction in the um, total clostridium. But we found interesting is that we actually saw an uptick in the amount of lactobacillus that we saw in those birds. So here to bring it together and show you how this can um, be beneficial in terms of a necrotic enteritis challenge, <clears throat> Rami, actually, this was in yours as well. <laughs> we need to have a conversation before we have these. <laughs> um, so here, this was the talk that was, or the, the trial that was done by Mc, uh, McReynolds, published in 2009. They had a uh, 10 to the 5 CFU of Clostridium perfringens challenge that they administered twice daily for three consecutive days on day 17. And they looked at a probiotic and a phytogenic feed additive. And they saw that both were able to significantly reduce the elision scores reduce mortality, and reduce the amount of clostridium perfringens in the cica of those birds. So another option, uh, we talked about um, protein digestibility. So some, <clears throat> one solution is to limit the ability or the availability of that, of the protein to the pathogens in the gut. Some switching to all veggie diets. I say, is Amy in here? Where'd she go? I put the question mark because of her. <laughs> Obviously, there's pros and cons um, to doing this. There's, there's, there's support for it, but some of it could also be marketing. Um, another way is to increase digestibility of those nutrients. So either we could use, there's been research out there on phytogenic feed additives, increasing digestibility, or the use of uh, enzymes. So here's a study looking at apparent allele digestibility uh, in the use of a phytogenic feed additive. So the blue bar here is the control, the green is the phytogenic feed additive. <clears throat> and we can see in this trial there was a significant increase in the uh, allele digestibility of crude protein as well as, those, uh, as well as total amino acids. And if we break that down to look at the individual amino acids, they saw the greatest increase in digestibility in your cysteine, threonine, lysine, arginine, methionine, and there's your, your total amino acid counts from before. And then if we take the performance uh, data from that trial, so the theory is if we increase digestibility of that protein, we take it away, take access away from those pathogens, now that's protein that the bird could use towards performance. So if we take and we look at the performance from that data, they saw 2.5%, a significant increase in the final body weight of those birds, as well as a significant decrease in the feed conversion of those birds. Coxy control. Coxy is another big issue that we talked about before. So what are different ways that we're helping to control that issue? Coccidiostats are one option that a lot of people are utilizing now, but there's obviously a concern with resistance building up. More and more people are starting to use vaccines. And another way is the use of probiotics and phytogenic feed additives. So here's a study done at Virginia Tech um, looking at the effect of probiotics on a COXI challenge. So we have negative control, positive control that was challenged, your salonomycin group and your probiotic group. <clears throat> and you can see in the, if we compare the uh, positive control group to your probiotic group, they saw a significant reduction in the lesion scores in the duodenum, and we saw the same story in the jejunum. 
Then they looked at average oocysts, um, oocysts shedding in the excreta from days 20 to 24. So in this case, the challenge was on day 15. <clears throat> so here's your positive control. Then we go down to our probiotic group and you can see that there was a significant reduction in the oocysts shedding of those birds. Now there's a lot of phytogenic feed additives that have been shown to be anti-protozoal, um, especially if they have high amounts of oregano or its bioactive components, carvacrol, thymol. Um, they've been shown to be um, anti-protozoal. So here, this was a, a mild coccidial challenge. So we had a challenge control, and we saw in a phytogenic feed additive group that was also challenged. And here you can see that there was a increase in bilis length. So Imeria, as they're replicating, they're causing a lot of damage to the epithelial lining, reducing the length of that villi. So here we were, we were able to reduce that consequence. And if we looked at goblet cell numbers, so goblet cells are those specialized epithelial cells that produce mucus, and the mucus helps protect the epithelial lining. So in the phytogenic feed additive group, we also saw a significant <coughs> increase in the amount of goblet cells uh, in those villi. And then if we look at the performance data from that trial, these birds were better able to cope with that challenge and we saw an improvement in performance in terms of uh, body weight gain and feed conversion. So the last subject that I touched on is mycotoxins. So mycotoxins, in this case we're going to be talking about trichothecenes, Don, have a significant effect on that intestinal integrity, as I touched on before. So here's a study by Springler uh, et al. that was just published in 2016. Here we have increasing concentrations of Don on the x-axis, and then here they measure transepithelial resistance, so a measurement of gut integrity here. And you can see as the concentration increases, that epithelial resistance is also decreasing. So we're, we're impairing that intestinal integrity. Now on the flip side, if we look at DOM1, DOM1 is a product of biotransformation. So uh, there is a enzyme that is produced by a bacteria known as BBSH, which was developed by <coughs> Biomin, that produces a deepoxidase. This deepoxidase is able to break up an epoxide ring that is common in all trichothecenes, so your DONs, your T2s, for example. And what it produces from that reaction is DOM1. And if we look here, we have increasing concentrations of DOM1, but we do not see that reduction in um, transepithelial resistance. So we're able to prevent that damage to intestinal integrity. <coughs> So what are the main takeaways? Switching to an ABF program is gonna require a paradigm shift, a, a shift in the thinking. We can't take a conventional program, remove antibiotics, and cross our fingers and hope for the best. It's not gonna work that way. And there is no silver bullet. There's, there's products out there, different, different types of probiotics, and if anybody tells you this is a replacement for antibiotics, they're lying to you. There is no simple replacement for an antibiotic. It doesn't work that way. Now, can they be part of the solution? Absolutely. But it's gonna take a, a much bigger change than that. So we need to find a means to support and maintain that gut health to ensure that the bird is healthy and help prevent those issues like necrotic enteritis. So there could be changes in the feeding program, in the management program, uh, in your overall health program, all of these need to be looked at to find a successful program that works in your scenario. And as I said, natural fee additives may play a role in that because of their ability to alter that gut microbiota in a beneficial way, improve the intestinal integrity, the physiology, and help support the immune system of that bird. So I know I'm sure, I'm sure I finished early. <laughs> so if any of you have any questions,